Welcome to Evangelical Focus. My name is Joel Forster, and today we have the, uh, the pleasure, the opportunity to talk to John Wyatt, Professor John Wyatt from the United Kingdom. He's a medical doctor with long experience, author of several books, and he has been doing research as well. He has been speaking on, on a range of, of, of topics related to, to the medicine uh, and, and the life experience of, of many people. And he will be the main speaker at the Jornadas de Bioética uh, of Spain, which is a once in a decade bioethics, bioethics congress of the Spanish Evangelical Christians, which will be attended by, by people who are experts in, in those issues, but also uh, pastors from churches and members of the public uh, trying to think about the current um, issues of bioethics. So welcome, John. Thank you for being with us. Thanks so much, Joel. It's, it's great to be here. John, we want to hear uh, what you have to say a bit uh, on several issues that have been on the table for, for some time, for some years in society, uh, such as the beginning of life and also the end of life. But let's start um, with uh, one of the latest ethical issues that is coming up, uh, which is the evolution of technology. And it is said uh, that in the, in the 2000s, they, um, we should learn about programming, then in 2010s, uh, the, the, the day, this decade was about using social media and now in the 2020s the, the issue should be to understand artificial intelligence. So what does someone who hasn't yet taken much interest in artificial intelligence need to understand about how these technologies are changing our lives, John? Well, there's no doubt that uh, artificial intelligence is an incredibly important form of technology which is already uh, changing our lives in, in lots of ways that we don't see um, and i think when historians look back on the 21st century um, and they and particularly historians of technology they will say that this was a a revolution taking place and of course when you're in the middle of a revolution uh, it's very very hard to get your head around it <clears throat> and i think all of us are struggling to try to understand what is the significance of, of what's going on. But in a nutshell, I think that um, computer technology is reaching an extraordinary level of power and sophistication uh, where it's able to do many things which um, is simply not possible for the human brain to fully understand. Um, but this is leading to a great deal of confusion and 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 questioning <clears throat> and part of the issue is all to do with science fiction so um the extraordinary thing <clears throat> sorry i have a, a frog in my throat the extraordinary thing is that uh, novelists and dramatists filmmakers have been uh, exploring questions of artificial intelligence for the last hundred years uh, before the technology became um, apparent now it's as though science and reality is catching up with science fiction, uh, but there is a very interesting connection between the, the fiction and the way that the technologists are bringing it into reality. Mm. So you have, you have been involved uh, in thinking about this from a Christian perspective, and th there is a project, uh, a website, which is called techhuman.org. Uh, it's a resource website to help churches uh, think about how technology affects humanity. Um, so do you think uh, we, as Christians and the churches are kind of lagging behind and not, not really following the, 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 the technology, not understanding how, how it is working, or is all of society a bit lost in, in this issue? Well, I think it, it is true that everybody is um, <clears throat> grappling, trying to understand what is going on, but, but perhaps there are particular problems for many Christian people. Um, <clears throat> I think partly, um, many Christian teachers, preachers and pastors, uh, they come from a humanities background. They don't come from a science and technology background. These are not issues that interest them. And so they tend to ignore uh, what's going on in science and technology and regard it as not very important. Um, and I think that um, it's, it's the younger people. It, it's often, you know, they talk about the digital natives, young people who spend the whole of their time uh, in an online world, who are much more aware of the power of technology, who are using it every day. Uh, and yet often it's the older people's voices we hear in the leadership and so on. 
And perhaps the third reason is that so often and quite rightly, as Christians, we look back over the history of Christian thinking for the last 2000 years. Uh, I myself in my working about bioethics, I often have tried to grapple with what the church fathers said about uh, abortion and about suicide and, and death and so on. Um, but when we come to these modern issues, we find that our Christian tradition in some way, not surprisingly, uh, there is very little information, very little thinking has been going on previously. How should we think about machines that appear to be intelligent, machines that can replicate it in some ways our own human thinking? So I do think there is an urgent need for Christians in particular to try to grapple with these issues and to try to build a bridge between the world of the historic biblical Christian faith and these very new and very challenging and difficult issues we are now facing. Mm -hmm. Let's let's move on to to another bioethic <laughs> issue, which is very um, discussed, very much discussed in Europe at the moment, which is euthanasia or suicide and um, assisted <laughs> suicide. And you have an extensive experience as a as a medical doctor. You have been involved in research. You have had um, also one to one conversations with with many patients. Um, and you have recently um, written a book. Uh, about this issue. Yeah, I have, I have a, a, a Spanish copy here in, in Spanish, which is called Morir Bien, um, but also, of course, in English. Um, what, what is the book about and how, how are you trying to communicate to, to people reading this book um, what is a, a Christian perspective about how to die well? So I think one of the positive things about the whole debate about euthanasia, which is going on across Europe, is that it is helping us, helping people to think more about what it means to die well. Uh, what, uh, instead of just pushing this into the back and saying we never want to think about dying. So at least the topic is on the agenda. And I'm convinced that Christians have a very particular perspective on this. And that's why I wrote the book Dying Well. Um, it was actually to try to recover an old tradition in the Christian history, which goes back to medieval Europe, called the Ars Moriendi, writings called um, in, in Latin, uh, meaning uh, dying well, the art of dying. Yeah. And um, this is uh, a tradition that was very prominent in medieval Europe. And in a way, I'm trying to uh, rehabilitate, reimagine that that vision for the 21st century as a kind of self-help way of Christians who are approaching death, who are helping others to, to try to give them resources. And I think the two most important things are, first of all, that dying well has a, is actually a, a wonderful opportunity. You know, I have seen time and again how that those last hours, days and weeks can be an incredibly rich time of discovering a new purpose, new meaning, uh, forgiveness of relationships, uh, fulfilling dreams, uh, passing on a legacy, many positive things that can happen. But at the same time, I wanted to be honest and address some of the fears and anxieties about death and dying, about pain, about suffering, about, about uh, the um, loss of meaning, um, what 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 are the temptations and the dangers of dying and, and trying to help people give resources and help to see that dying in Christian thinking becomes a gateway, a way th uh, from this uh, present uh, earth into a new prospect and, and something and therefore that we need to focus on the future, not just looking back into the past. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a good opportunity to to give an, another perspective different that don't, than what we hear in, in the politics and in, in, in all the big debates in the media. And um, going back to, to the issue of euthanasia, um, there is often this conversation about the, the pressure on the weak, on, on the people who are, who are elderly, who are ill, and who uh, need the support from family members or, 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 or even a big financial burden, so to say, uh, for their families. Um, and some of them would would feel that they should ask for for assisted uh, suicide and to to not be a, any more a problem for the people around them. And um, is that a reality that you have seen? What do you think about about this tension that people suffer? Well, I do think this is one of the most um, 
evil aspects of of the legalization of euthanasia i, I think there are many reasons why uh, making this a, a legal process is actually unhelpful but but the most worrying is the fact these very subtle uh, uh, pressures on elderly and disabled people um, and what seems to me so terrible is that is that this is being presented almost as a form of altruism you know that that you don't addressing elderly people and saying you know maybe the most loving thing the most um, uh, caring thing you can do for your relatives for your children for your loved ones the most caring thing you can do is to allow yourself to be killed or to or to kill yourself and and this seems to me such a perversion of the truth um and, and of a christian way of understanding life as a gift from god um so I, I think I am very concerned about that. There are many, many people, many older people in our societies across Europe who are who are aging, who are lonely, who feel that life has no purpose. And, and there is already we're starting to see pressure, particularly in places such as the Netherlands, uh, to to argue that when I feel that my life is pointless, uh, I should have the right uh, to be uh, able to kill myself or for a doctor to kill me. And and so this seems to me a, a policy of despair and hopelessness. Whereas Christian thinking always says life is precious and therefore Christian love says to a person, it's good that you exist. It's good that you're in the world. That's a way of saying to another person, it's something we're called to do to say to each other. It's good that you exist. It's good that you're in the world. What euthanasia does is it takes, says the opposite. It says, actually, it's bad that you exist. It would be much better for the world if you didn't exist. And that seems to me a perversion of Christian love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, in, in conversations with, with people who are, who are uh, suffering for a long time, um, you would sometimes perhaps not from that person, but in the general debate, you would hear this argument saying, oh, you, you Christians say uh, you are not in favor of euthanasia, or at least not in, in a liberal way of, of understanding euthanasia. Um, but what about people who are suffering for a long time and have no solution in sight and who are really wanting to be relieved of that suffering? What, what is our response as Christians? Yes, and of course, it's a very important issue. And... Christians are sometimes caricatured as being like sadists or masochists. We actually celebrate the fact that people are in agony. And, and that's completely wrong. Uh, of course, you know, as, as followers of Christ, we are deeply concerned to show compassion of, uh, to people who are suffering. And, and that compassion for suffering people has motivated the development of, of and the involvement of Christians in healthcare and the development of all many different aspects of medicine and medical care for for centuries. Um, but it's very important to understand that suffering is a much more complex phenomenon than people often imagine. People imagine that suffering at the end of life is basically a physical phenomenon, uh, which sometimes drugs work and sometimes they don't work and there's nothing that can be done. And nothing could be further from the truth. What the um, the great pioneers of palliative care, which started in the UK, and particularly with Cicely Saunders, a Christian physician, she recognized that suffering at the end of life had many components, but in particular, there were four things. There was physical pain, there was relational pain, there was psychological pain, and there was spiritual pain. And of those four kinds of suffering, the physical pain, what all doctors discover, is the physical pain is the easy kind of pain to eradicate. There's no fundamental medical reason these days why anybody who's facing death should have terrible physical pain. Mm. The problem kinds of pain are the other kinds of pain. Psychological pain where there's anxiety or depression, uh, uh, morbid thinking and so on. Relational pain, so often there are broken relationships. Um, there's guilt, there's antagonism, there's failure in the social relationships and then spiritual pain many many people coming to the end of their life face either great feelings of guilt and failure or maybe feelings of meaninglessness 
um, and, and the pointlessness of existence. And these are the factors which cause the greatest suffering at the end of life. And what we have discovered is that rather than just obliterate the person you, by using euthanasia in order to get rid of the pain, it's much better to try and address the root causes. So if there's psychological pain, then we should try to have uh, support, friendship, companionship, talking therapies if necessary. If there's relational pain, then we try to find a, a reconciliation to help <clears throat> people to, to be reconciled together. And finally, if there's spiritual pain, we address the spiritual aspects by providing uh, opportunities for um, redemption, for forgiveness, <clears throat> for Christian worship, for prayer, uh, for the Holy Communion and so on. So there are many things we can do to address pain and um, rather than see it as something that is completely hopeless, that there's nothing that can be done, the only solution is death itself. Mm. That's, that's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> artificial intelligence, <clears throat> euthanasia, and uh, we're moving to abortion <laughs> and uh, the start of life. <clears throat> and and uh, again, the, the, the debate on, on, on abortion or, or the, the, the beginning of life is very much on, on the table again with the Roe versus uh, Wade um, ruling in the United States and at the same time the European Union uh, just um, in, in, in June uh, 2022 uh, was, was pushing abortion in, in, in all countries and saying uh, the European Parliament saying it was a, it is a fundamental right that should be um, implemented in law even in the constitution, for instance, France is just debating that to in, include abortion in, into, into in the constitution. So, um, how, how do you see the, the social political trends at the moment regarding abortion? Well, it's an extremely confused, contested, <clears throat> and polarized situation. Um, <clears throat> in particular, the um, the political situation in in the USA has enormous influence here in Europe. And yet it's important to understand really that it's very, very different. The, the situation in the USA uh, is very different from our experience in Europe. And I think sometimes it, it's unhelpful to, to try to make simplistic comparisons between what's going on in, in the USA. In particular, in the USA, abortion has become the most extraordinarily polarized, toxic political issue. Uh, and many people say that abortion is going to uh, be one of the major influences in, in the entire political debate, uh, both uh, in, in the midterm elections in 2022, but also in the next uh, presidential elections. Mm -hmm. and, and because it is central to the political debate, it becomes hugely toxic and polarized. Um, I think what we see <clears throat> happening across the states, and also to a lesser extent with the same kind of polarized debate in Europe, is that the law is a very blunt instrument. And um, although law is important, it is not, in <clears throat> my view, the fundamental issue um, in, in abortion. The, the fundamental issue is changes in attitudes. I mean, what we have seen <clears throat> over the last 60, 70 years is an extraordinary revolution in people's attitudes to sexuality. Um, and for instance, here in the UK, uh, the median onset of regular sexual intercourse is, is between 16 and 17 years, something like that. And yet the age at which a woman wants to have her first ba baby is 30, the median age of the first baby. So in other words, <clears throat> what this tells us is that vast numbers of people in our society are wishing to have regular sexual intercourse, but have no wish to have a baby. Mm. And, and that is the fundamental issue which lies behind uh, the whole question of, of abortion and so on. And so I am... Um, a believer in the slogan that says our goal is not to make abortion illegal it is to make it unthinkable mm. in other words our primary aim is to try to help people to change thinking to change people's attitudes uh, towards um, sexuality and relationships 
and pregnancy and so on. Um, and I think we see over time that social attitudes do change. And, and we've seen over the centuries remarkable changes in social attitudes. And by God's grace, it would be possible uh, for there to be a sea change in people's attitudes towards pregnancy and towards uh, sexuality and so on. And putting forward a positive view, helping Christians rather than to be saying something that is negative, we are against abortion, we're against uh, taking unborn life, instead of saying positively, this is how a Christian understanding of sexuality, a Christian understanding of relationships, a Christian understanding of how precious life is. You know, whenever we say that something is wrong from a Christian point of view, we must immediately say, and here is a better way. Here, here is a more positive response. I am particularly encouraged and, and I'm, I'm part of the a, a pregnancy centers movement here in the UK of Christians, uh, volunteers and professional counselors getting together and offering um, compassionate counseling support uh, for women with an unplanned pregnancy. And um, it, that seems to be a much more positive and Christ-like response to this terribly polarized and toxic situation we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and a lot of the, the debate about abortion in society, especially in the media and also when there is political debate, uh, seems to, to be around the, the language that we use. And so, for instance, in, in Spain or in other countries, in, uh, the, the, the term would not be abortion in the laws, but voluntary termination pregnancy and in the annual reports and with the statistics, uh, you, you would use the, 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 the abbreviation of, of, of that term. Instead. So try to change the language so that it's not um, not um, as, as cruel as, as, as a reality probably is. No? And why are definitions and the concepts important in the debate around life and abortion? It's a very important point, and, and it's... Uh important to understand that in this particular debate there is no neutral language mm -hmm. as so as soon as we have chosen the language we wish to use we're already expressing a moral position mm. so if you talk about the unborn baby uh, you're already taking a moral position about the significance of the being in the womb. If you talk about a pregnancy or a fetus, again, you're already taking a moral position that, that, that this being is disposable. And it's fascinating. We, we see this in the medical world. So uh, in the antenatal clinic, when an ultrasound is being performed of a, of a, a pregnant woman and of an unborn baby, for the medical professional, the most important thing is to work out whether the baby is wanted or not. If the baby is wanted, the medical professional will use baby language. He will say, oh, look, the baby is waving his arm and always oh, got his daddy's nose and he's looking very active today. And it's all very, very baby talk. It's all compassionate and, 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 and caring and so on. But if the pregnancy is unwanted, um, then the attitude is quite different. The screen is turned away from the mother and the professional now uses language that says, well, the pregnancy is probably about 10 weeks gestation and appears to be uh, normally formed. It, it, it's completely uh, neutral, uh, scientific, negative language. And yet the being in the womb is exactly the same. Mm. And so this is the kind of double think that modern uh, people have have found themselves in. So at the same time, we're celebrating the importance of of, of mothers to grieve the miscarriage um, of of a baby and and the, the importance of the unborn, uh, the experience for their life or their future life, and so on. And at the same time, we are saying every woman has the right to destroy um, the baby in her womb. Uh, this is a human right. And, and so there's a deep, deep confusion here, but we should not be surprised about the concentration on language because 
that I love there's a an old proverb that says the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper names and we find in the biblical narrative there is a constant attack on language so in Genesis chapter 3 the very first thing that the evil one says in the biblical narrative is did God really say in a, and then there is the twisting and the manipulation right. of what God said. So the attack on language often comes before the change in practice, before the attack on behavior. Mm -hmm. That's that's really interesting. We we are we're finishing our our conversation shortly, but two more questions. One has to do with the with the bioethics and conference uh, in Spain that you are uh, the main speaker. Uh, you will be talking about several of these issues that we have um, been addressing here but one more is uh, creation care and um, concepts such as sustainability or the fight against climate change are very common in political and media discourse at the moment what difference can christians make in this debate well i think it's it's wonderful that we are combining in the conference both the concern for human life in bioethics and a concern for the entire creation in creation care so often these things have been thought of as entirely separate um concerns uh, but of course at root they are all fundamentally about the glory of and honor of god it is recognizing uh, god's glory and honor as the creator both of every individual human life and and therefore of its unique value and status but also of the entire cosmos of the entire creation which god has created as again as a reflection of his own uh, glory and as we see in the scriptures i'm i'm, I'm afraid that uh, historically christians have been uh rather late to make yeah. these connections uh, to, to to understand that creation care is in fact a, a central part of our calling to be followers of christ and um it's often been secular thinkers ecologists and uh environmental scientists and so on who've been at the forefront but I, i'm i'm really glad to say that um that is no longer uh, the case. I think that many, many uh, Christian uh, teachers and Bible scholars and so on have uh, are recognizing the, the importance of creation care. So I do think we, as Christians, we do have a, a distinctive voice. And that is because so much of secular creation care is based on the idea of, of, of you know, nature with a capital N, uh, but there is no personal element. Uh, it, it's just, it's wonderful, isn't this? And, and somehow we should look after nature. Uh, what, as Christians, what we understand is, is that creation is a gift and we celebrate the giver. We celebrate the one who is constantly reaching out to us in the cosmos, who is, whose glory uh, is reflected, his power, who, whose nature is reflected both in the cosmos and in the human beings who are part of the created order. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, John, um, those of us who have children or, <clears throat> or people who have grandchildren, they look to the future and it's difficult to imagine how society, how Europe will look in 2050. Um, um, but what should Christians be doing now in this area, in this big area of bioethics to influence our societies for good? I completely understand the concern. I have recently become a grandfather. And as I look at uh, our four grandchildren, you know, you, you think, what kind of world are we bringing them into? What, um, how will they be able to follow Christ? And what challenges will they face? Um, I, I think the first thing I think what I would say is that it's fascinating how when God appears in the biblical narrative in, in a new way, when he reveals himself in a new way, so often the first thing he says is don't be afraid hmm. um, that the God is 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 however the challenges and uh, difficulties that we face we need to remind ourselves that that God is the Lord of history and that we shouldn't be afraid in fact we should be excited at the new challenges and possibilities that are coming 
And I, th I think we need to focus again on the two um, metaphors that Jesus has used. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And those metaphors are extremely encouraging because you don't need much salt. You only need a tiny little bit of salt to have a very massive disinfectant and preservative effect. Um, and, and the same is true in, in society. A small number of Christians who are being faithful to Christ can have an extraordinary uh, influence. And the same with light. You only need a very small amount of light to penetrate into a large area of darkness. So it seems to me that those metaphors of salt and light are extremely positive and encouraging. But of course, our challenge is, are we really being genuinely salty? Are we really maintaining our distinctives, our Christian distinctives? Are we really allowing our good deeds, as Jesus said, to penetrate, to illuminate the world um, and to shine light into dark areas which people want to keep hidden? I think by God's grace, if we can continue to function as salt and light, we can trust him to what his plans and purposes are and how they will ultimately be resolved in the, the as we come ultimately to the formation of the new creation in which all these issues are going to be resolved and where the glory and the honor of the nations are going to be brought in to the new Jerusalem. Thank you for this last challenge and to think also about the future. Thank you for the time you spent with us, Professor John Wyatt, and uh, may God bless you and use you as he has done in these years. Thanks so much, Joel. It's been great to talk to you.